Welcome back everyone and today we're going to be improving the serotonin synthesis. So if you saw my previous video on making serotonin from 5-HTP aka 5-hydroxytryptophan, you know our yields were awful. And here's what the sample looks like now. And overall, it's just crap. So today we're going to try to improve that synthesis and get, uh, you know, some actual decent yields. Maybe not great yields, but decent yields. Also, if you want to learn more about neurotransmitters in general, including serotonin, dopamine, things like that, I do recommend go watching another YouTuber's video. Um, it's That Chemist. He has a neurotransmitter video. I'll have a link down in the description. It's really good, really informative, and uh, it will give you a better overview of these neurotransmitters than uh, I can do. So go ahead and watch that. But to make a long story short, if you didn't watch my previous video, serotonin is essentially a neurotransmitter of satisfaction and good feeling. Um, even though that's extremely oversimplified, like most of my neurotransmitter videos, um, that's just in the central nervous system and in the brain. Serotonin also exists outside the brain, which it doesn't cross into the brain if it's outside of it. So uh, that controls other things like bowel functions and things like that. Most of these neurotransmitters have many different functions, um, but you know, there's the main ones people think about in the central nervous system, such as happiness and satisfaction and that mainly comes from serotonin. Okay, so let's get into it and improve the serotonin synthesis and get some decent yields out, hopefully. And uh, yeah, let's make some serotonin. So like before, we are going to be doing a ketone catalyzed decarboxylation, and we're gonna be using acetophenone for our solvent. Oh, it's frozen. Oh, it's gonna take forever to desaw. <sighs> anyway, we're gonna be using acetophenone as our high boiling point solvent and our uh, ketone you know, catalyst. So uh, yeah, I'll wait for this to dethaw and then I will uh, come back. Okay, our acetophenone is uh, now melted. And yes, it is technically acetophenone, not acetophenone. But yeah, I'm dyslexic as hell, so I commonly mispronounce things. Anyway, I'm first going to start by adding 150 milliliters of our acetophenone into this beaker here. Oh, come on, just get up to 150, get up to 150. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You're almost there, you're almost there. Oh, and, and yes, it is yellow because I've distilled this from previous <laughs> serotonin runs and uh, well, the first distillation always comes out a little bit yellow and a bit smelly, but that would be due to the indoles. Now into a 250 milliliter flask that I have on a bead bath. This is just to help the, uh, you know, heat circulate better because round bottom flask, flat plate, you know. Anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and add our acetophenone into there just like that. So let's add our other roughly 25 milliliters of acetophenone. Also, the yellow color in there due to, okay. The yellow color is due to some impurities, but it's not going to affect it at all, really. Um, it's not that big of a deal. So go ahead and start cranking up the heat to high to start getting this to warm up and now we'll weigh out our 5-HTP. I just noticed something interesting. You know the last time I said it looked like it was rolling around in mud? I thought I just got it dirty but this is literally a brand new bag that I opened and I just t took a look at it and I haven't used anything out of it but uh you see how brown it is? I think on exposure to air it just decomposes into that brown powder because the yeah I did not roll this around in dirt. <laughs> okay, now we gotta weigh out 15 grams of our 5-HTP. So I'm gonna be doubling the amount we did last time. And uh, yeah, it's because you know, even no matter what, if we theoretically improve it the best we can, um, we're still gonna be you know, at a theoretical 25% yield. And I'll explain that uh, later. But technically that's 16 grams, but you know, a little bit extra ain't gonna hurt. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add our 5-HTP to our acetophenone. Oh, some of that got on the hot plate, now it's burning. <laughs> I'm going to add a stir bar and get that stern. So now here I got this argon tank and I'm going to fill this balloon with argon because we're gonna use this to shield the reaction to make sure air doesn't get to it and uh, you know tar it up, so. That's plenty of argon right there, and we'll use that to flush our reaction. First, I'm gonna take the balloon and dump some argon into this flask. Okay, and now I'm gonna take this condenser, throw it on top there, and then I'm going to flush out the condenser. 
just like that. So our thing should be flushed with argon. And then I'm just gonna take the balloon and add it over top like that. And we'll use this balloon to measure our CO2 output because this theoretically should produce like 350 milliliters CO2. I'm, I'm gonna have to run my Stokey Island tree one more time. But uh, it's somewhere around there, so we can actually measure how much CO2 we're outputting uh, through this balloon. So now all we gotta do is just like last time, let this run, heat up. We should be seeing when it's decarboxylating, when this balloon really starts filling up. Um, it's gonna fill up a little bit due to the expansion of the argon. Um, but yeah. So let me explain what's going on a little bit more. And right here when we're doing a ketone catalyzed decarboxylation. So this is going to form an imine with our 5-HTP, right? It's gonna help it decarboxylate a lot easier. That's why you still can decarboxylate it in just a high boiling point solvent, but without that imine, it doesn't wanna decarboxylate as easy. So that's why we do the ketone catalyzed decarboxylation. And further hydrolysis after that will get rid of our imine and leave us with our serotonin, which we can then extract. Another thing I'm doing here to help improve the synthesis is one, I'm using more of our acetophenone for 5-HTP. So last time I only did what, uh, 50 milliliters for seven grams of 5-HTP. And as you saw, that simply wasn't enough to dissolve all of it. So this time I'm using, you know, roughly around uh, 50 milliliters per five grams. So hopefully this should improve things. And uh, yeah, we'll see if this all fully dissolves and decarboxylates. Here it is about 20 minutes in. I may not get that accurate here on the balloon because it seems that we got a leak. And every time I try to press down to seal it, well, it doesn't do anything. I don't know if that's leaking or just something in the joint boiling, if you can see there. I think it's leaking. I don't really know exactly, but I mean, the balloon, balloon is holding pressure. So we'll see, but yeah, there it is there. Still doesn't fully dissolve, so we'll give it some more time. Okay, here we are about 45 minutes in. I'd say it's about 350 milliliters of gas, probably even more, more like 500 milliliters. But you gotta think the expansion and once everything kind of cools down, this will shrink a bit and we'll just be left with our CO2. And yeah, there it is down there. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off heat and just leave this stirring and uh, let it cool down. By, by the time it cools down, everything in there should have fully dissolved. Okay, our solution has cooled down now. That's where we're left with up there. I've let it sit for like two hours because I wanted to go eat something while I waited for it to cool down. Um, and I think some of our gas has escaped, but most of it's decarboxylated and it has turned black in there, um, obviously due to some decomposition. So let's go ahead and set up our hydrolysis step. Now I'm gonna make our hydrolysis mixture. So for that, I'm going to use glacial acetic acid and we're not gonna be using HCl because as I saw last time, the HCl decomposes um, our serotonin quite rapidly. And yeah, after doing some more research, indoles are attacked by strong acids like hydrochloric acid. So that accounts for the decomposition. But anyway, so let's go ahead and make a 10% acetic acid solution. So to this grad cylinder, I'm going to add 10 milliliters of glacial acetic acid which is pretty much just pure acetic acid. So 10 milliliters of that. And then the rest of it, we will fill with distilled water. Just like that, perfect. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that to the beaker. And then I'm going to make one more of this because in total, we're gonna want 200 milliliters of 10% acetic acid. Okay, and we will add that to our beaker here. But this will be our hydrolysis mixture. So go ahead and add our decarboxylation mixture into here just like this. <clears throat> and now I'm going to wash out our flask here with some of our acetic acid solution. Yeah, I'm gonna take the stir rod to break up some of that gunk up on the bottom. Dip that into solution. Oh my God, I didn't hit record. But anyway, I got most of it broken up and dissolved and I just went ahead and uh, dumped it into our hydrolysis mixture. Okay, so now I'm just gonna go ahead and give it strong stirring, if that will stir, yeah. Give it really strong stirring, I want a good extraction. So essentially what we're doing now is doing the hydrolysis and then also at the same time it's protonating that amine slash imine and it's pulling it down into the water layer. So right now we just gotta stir it to make sure we get it all extracted from the organic layer, right? So um, yeah, all you gotta do is just let that stir super strong. 
Okay, so it's been stirring for quite a while. So you've got a nice black mixture over there. Let's go ahead and throw this into the SEP funnel and separate it out because we're going to want our aqueous layer. So I'm just going to go ahead and dump this all in. Anyway, we'll go ahead and let that just uh, separate out into two distinct layers and then we will uh, continue our processing. So our first layers have separated, might be kind of hard to see. There's still some little blobs in the top up there, but uh, it's good enough because we're going to have to add more in after anyway. So I'm just going to go ahead and decant the bottom layer. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, let's let it run. Let me take the cap off first. That's an important step. Okay. Sitting now and it's fully separated. So let's go ahead. I'm just realizing the measurements on this beaker are, are whack. Like 80 milliliters, 160, 240, what weird increments they put on there. But anyway, let's go ahead and dump off our bottom layer, which should be our acetophenone. Try to get all of the acetophenone out of there as I can, so. I do this technique to kind of pound down those little beads of it in there. Hopefully that will get it down to the bottom, which some of it is starting to form at the bottom, so that's good. And uh, let's pour off our acetophenone there. I'm going to go ahead and change out our flask, well, our beaker, for this beaker right here, and we'll go ahead and drain off our aqueous slayer. Ooh, looks like we have some acetophenone at the very top. You see that there? Yeah, it's weird. Some of it floated and then most of it sank. Strange. Okay, so now we're gonna make our neutralizing solutions. And that's pretty much to make this alkaline to a pH of 10.3 over here. So let's go ahead and add some distilled water to both of these. This is our sodium bicarbonate over here and this is our sodium carbonate over here. We really don't need that much sodium carbonate. It's a little too much, but uh, it'll be fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn on heating to get all these fully dissolved. Now what I'm going to do with this solution here is add a stir bar, throw it on the stir plate. Okay, I'm gonna slow down the stirring speed on that. But this is what we'll use right here to you know, keep the solution stirred to make sure the pH is uh, accurate when we measure it. Okay, so our solutions over here are already starting to get dissolved quite a bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and start neutralizing. So first we're gonna use the sodium bicarbonate. This will reach us a pH of about eight or nine roughly. So that'll kind of be in there just to get rid of the acidity and it will bring it into basic conditions. But Again, only eight or nine. Our goal is a pH of about 10.3. Okay, so we can start adding our sodium carbonate solution. Bring this around pH 10.3. Oh yeah, you can really see the serotonin starting to precipitate. Shouldn't take much of our sodium carbonate to get this to 10.3. Now I won't be able to know exactly if it's at 10.3 or like 10 and a half because, well, pH paper. It would be nice to have a nice pH meter. Okay, that looks about pH 10. Let me add a bit more sodium carbonate. It's still precipitating when I add the carbonate in. I'd say that is pH 10 right there, the dark blue. So we're in close enough of the range, so I'll consider this good. I'm gonna turn stirring off and let that settle. Okay, here's our extraction mixture. It looks like there's some acetophenone forming, maybe due to hydrolysis. I don't, I swear there's no acetophenone in there originally, but man, there's quite a bit of it. Anyway, uh, with this one, I'm gonna go ahead and do a solvent extraction. So we'll go ahead and take some isopropanol. It should separate out due to the high salt concentration content in here. And uh, yeah, we'll give that a good stir on the stir plate and hopefully it'll separate out. 
So I wanna spend a little bit more time talking about why the acid-base extraction for the serotonin synthesis is not very good and it actually limits our yields to 25%. Yeah, that bad. And uh, let me explain because last video I just talked, I just said it's solubility makes it an issue. And it comes down to the PKA values of serotonin. So usually, right, say if this was just tryptamine, okay? The procedure for the tryptamine decarboxylation and acid base extraction is pretty simple. You have to go ahead and do the hydrolysis step and get it as the salt, right? All you do is just add aqueous uh, sodium hydroxide until it precipitates out and you can bring it up to pH 14 and it'll precipitate out nicely. And how the pKa and pH system works is if the pH equals the pKa, half of that is protonated, right? So on the amine here, there's a pKa of 9.97, I believe. So when the pH is at 9.97, you can assume that half of that is in the protonated form, which means half of it is water soluble. So if we had the pH at 9.97, we're only gonna have a 50% yield because the rest is gonna be soluble in the water. So you say, okay, just bring it up to pH you know, 14 using a strong base and you can get all of it to crash out because you're gonna be going way past the halfway point. And yes, that would work if serotonin didn't have this phenolic group here. This phenolic group makes everything a lot more frustrating because that has a pKa of 10.7. So that means if we go over 10.7, we're gonna start really deprotonating that phenolic group and then it's gonna become water soluble because it's not neutral anymore. So the best we can do is sit right in the middle at around 10.3. But just for simplicity's sake, let's assume that the pH is equal to both the pKa's. This is gonna limit our yield down to 25% because half of it is gonna be protonated at the amine, making it water soluble, and half of it's gonna be deprotonated at the phenolic group, also making it water soluble. So that leaves our total grand yield. If everything else is 100% at 25%. That's why I said the acid base extraction sucks, but there really isn't an easier method other than the acid base extraction to do this. Like it's simply the easiest method possible. Um, so yeah, but it kind of sucks. But with this, that means theoretically we can get a max of about 3.75 grams because we started with 15 grams of 5-hydroxy tryptophan. Well, actually it's going to be even less than that because that's just uh, not including the loss of the carboxyl group on there, which is going to lower the milk. Like, which is gonna lower the molecular weight and make it even smaller, a smaller amount. But mole-wise, yeah, it's gonna be a quarter of the moles. So yeah, that's why acid base extraction sucks. And uh, well, we're gonna have to do it anyway. So let's hope this turns out good. Okay, here's our solution now. Ignore the large volume. I had to add a bunch of brine solution to it to get the isopropanol to separate. But the isopropanol did pick up some stuff. So let's go ahead and dump it all into our set funnel here. Hopefully we can get pretty much the whole top layer and then we can separate it, which I think we might get just about all of it. Our alcohol layer did dissolve something. It's black, so we will see. Go ahead and process our alcohol solution because this is where I believe our serotonin is in. I'm going to make a 10% sulfuric acid solution by adding a milliliter of sulfuric acid to this graduated cylinder. And then I'll add 10 milliliters of water, well, up to the 10 milliliter point. Just like that. Pretty much, we're going to almost add all of this into our beaker here. And this will turn all the serotonin free base into serotonin sulfate. Well, there's one thing I probably didn't account for there, and that was the alcoholic solution being basic. Now in this round bottom flask, it is a little wet on the outside, but no big, but no biggie. We'll go ahead and add our solution and we are going to boil it down. And now on top of it, I'm gonna add this vacuum takeoff adapter. This pretty much just forces all the vapors out here and it won't let air back in to oxidize any crap. So later on in our synthesis of serotonin, I'm going to isolate it as a creatinine sulfate complex instead of the hydrochloride salt or anything like that. Um, so for that, we're gonna need to make creatinine and uh, we're gonna use uh, creatine to make that. About to get massive gains here massive gains 
So I'm gonna go ahead and weigh out about 10 grams of our creatine monohydrate. 10.7, a little bit extra is fine. Not gonna hurt anything. I'm now going to add 20 milliliters of 20% hydrochloric acid into our flask here with our creatine. So at first, this is just going to form the hydrochloride salts um, and it should dissolve it pretty rapidly because creatine is very soluble, especially in acidic conditions. All we gotta do is add it to a hot plate and put on medium heating and let that boil down to dryness and we'll be left with our creatinine hydrochloride. Here is our creatinine hydrochloride now. This is the uh, solution after boiling down. Did heat it up a little too hot you can see it started decomposing on the bottom, but no worries. So now to turn this from the hydrochloride salt into creatinine, what I'm gonna do is add 10 milliliters of 10% ammonia. Ammonia is the base, so this will liberate the hydrochloride salt. And uh, yeah, all I gotta do is give that a stir and uh, let that sit for a bit, and this should be turning it into the creatinine free base. Okay, it's been about 20 minutes now, and uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and gravity filtrate this. And we should collect off our creatinine. This is taking too long, so I'm gonna switch to vacuum and just vacuum it down. The creatinine we'll be using to isolate our serotonin. That's what it looks like there, nice white powder. So after boiling down, we're left with this nice black Tari type solution here, 25 milliliters of it, and it should contain our serotonin sulfate. So I'm gonna go ahead and transfer this to this Erlenmeyer flask right here. And we are going to isolate this as serotonin creatinine sulfate complex. We gotta weigh out 1.8 grams of our creatinine. Oh, almost dropped that and lost it. And I have our flask here on the hot plate, just warm it up to around 60 Celsius. I'm going to go ahead and add our creatinine. And give that a shake. Okay, now I'm going to measure out 63 milliliters of acetone. Oh my god, I hate these. I just painted my workbench. Come on, let's not go ahead and dissolve my workbench, please. Oh, I hate acetone. Well, I mean, I like acetone. I just hate those stupid freaking cans they put it in. Like, why? Why put it in a can that you literally are going to just spill? Okay, anyway, we end up getting 60, like, one, two milliliters, somewhere around there, so perfect. Going to go ahead and add this into our flask. Beautiful. Just like that, and we'll take it off heat. So now we'll throw this in the fridge. It should get a crystal precipitate of our serotonin creatinine sulfate. I'm going to move it into this dish here because <laughs> this uh, Erlenmeyer flask won't fit in the freezer section serotonin gold look at that oh look at those crystals oh and just like a paper that i read is the serotonin creatinine sulfate crystallizes in microscopic plates which that's what it is that's why it gives it that shiny look but let's not get our hopes up yet um let's go and do a melting point test i got a thing of oil there to confirm that this is indeed serotonin creatinine sulfate and not just like the creatinine you know, something like that, some some BS. So again, let's not get our hopes up, but let's collect a sample of this and run a melting point analysis. But if that is our serotonin creatinine sulfate, God damn, that is beautiful. Look at that serotonin. Yields are looking good if that's what it is. Okay, anyway, let's uh, run a sample real quick. So I'm going to pull a sample out and move it to this paper towel where I will dry it. I'm using the paper towel so we get rid of any excess solvent in there. Okay, can I scoop some of this up, please? There we go. It's a good little sample of it. Let's grab a little bit more. So right now, I actually do not know the melting point of serotonin creatinine sulfate. 
I'm going to keep it that way so I don't have any, you know, confirmation bias because I feel like I have confirmation bias. Well, everyone has confirmation bias, but I feel like sometimes like I'm actively trying to seek out the right melting point. But, you know, this time I was like, I'm, I'm going to say screw that and uh, not do that. So, yeah. Okay, good. We got some crystals we can use. So... Let's clean off our stir rod here. I really need to invest in some, you know, nice little spoons. Uh, what are they called? The chemistry spoons. I, why can't I think of the name of them? Anyway, let's add this in. Just like that. We got it in our test tube, if you can see there. Okay, let's add our oil bath. And now I'm going to add our test tube on there. Why did I say peep? Oh, that's not good. And then at the 226 is when it fully melted. Um, and looking up the uh, data for the melting point, it's 216 to 219 Celsius. So I'll speed up the footage to make it easier to see, but I think it started melting at the 219 C point. Um, which is pretty accurate. So let's go ahead and set up for a vacuum filtration, put our filter paper in there. Okay, my tripod's messing up again. Turn on our vacuum pump, and I'm gonna break up some of these crystals here. Just get them floating around in the solution. Okay. Let's run it. Beautiful. Let's go ahead and wash that with some acid down. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, weigh out our yield. I'm gonna move everything into this nice bottle right here. Let's go ahead and tear that and uh, move our serotonin creatinine sulfate into it. It looks like a lot more than it is. It really doesn't weigh that much. You gotta think a bit of this is creatinine, a bit of this is sulfate, and uh, you know even a smaller portion of it is serotonin. But this compound, when dissolved in like you know human body, it releases pretty much just serotonin. So they do use the serotonin creatinine sulfate for research purposes. Okay, and there we are, 0 0.7 grams of our serotonin creatinine sulfate. Here it is, our serotonin creatinine sulfate. Woo! <laughs> so the yields, still really not good when you think about it but and here we have a workable amount of serotonin um maybe eventually i'll end up doing this with the dopamine too where i can improve the synthesis even more because right all these are just my first attempts at this stuff so it usually doesn't go good <laughs> um and then also working with what i have usually makes things not go very good right because simply if you want to do things properly, it's it's expensive and I'm I'm poor. Well, that wraps up for today's video. And here's our 700 milligrams of serotonin creatinine sulfate. Um, it is slightly brown, I guess an off-white, um, but Sigma Aldrich uh, puts it, their description as white to off-white. So it just, a little bit of decomposition makes it that brown color. I swear it turned more brown when I washed it with acetone. <laughs> I, I, I swear it made it more brown than less brown, but there it is, our serotonin creatinine sulfate. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time.